Today I'm going to be talking about challenges, uh, challenges to China's rise. You've heard uh, a lot about the many good things that are taking place, uh, and uh, I could tell you a lot of those good things too, uh, but I'm going to concentrate on challenges. But before I do that, I have to first address uh, my own uh, sense of being challenged here today, and also I want to address the teachers here uh, in terms of some of the challenges that you're going to be facing as you try to integrate uh, China into the curriculum. Okay. Uh, well, for me, it's a real challenge to be <coughs> present and speaking uh, before a group of such distinguished uh, and eminent and uh, accomplished uh, scholars and business people. Uh, it really, uh, it's, it's a daunting challenge to say anything that uh, really hasn't already been covered uh, by people and, of course, will be covered by others uh, who will be speaking. It, it does remind me of that, uh, that old story of the, uh, of, the, of the very good man, the amateur historian, uh, who uh, dies and goes to heaven. And there he is met at the pearly gates by St. Peter. And St. Peter says, for people like you, we reserve uh, the very highest of honors. You were a good husband and father, God-fearing man. For you, we reserve the honor of addressing the heavenly hosts on any, on any topic that you would like uh, to address them on, all the saints and angels, prophets. Man thinks for a minute and he says, well, while I was on earth, uh, I was uh, known as uh, the greatest amateur historian on the Johnstown flood. Now, you uh, teachers of American history, you know all about that. 1868 up until, I guess, Katrina, it was the greatest uh, disaster in terms of a flood in American history. So he said, uh, well, St. Peter, I, I would like to speak about the Johnstown flood. St. Peter uh, scratches his beard for a minute and he says, okay, I, I can arrange that, but there's something you need to know. <laughs> Noah will be in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> and so I tread carefully indeed here. Now, the challenge for you as teachers um, is going to be, I think, uh, creating, well, uh, overturning or addressing perhaps is the better term, addressing uh, the kind of misperceptions that are out there uh, about China. And I have to say, despite the tremendous work of the 1990 Institute, the Committee of 100, and the Chinese government itself by setting up Confucius Institutes around the world and uh, what have you, the unfortunate fact of the matter is that uh, China's image uh, in the United States, and in particular in the United States, but also in Europe, Germany for instance, China's image is not good. Now, recently there was a Pew poll, uh, and uh, China's uh, favorable image in the United States is the lowest it has been uh, since the poll was taken in 2005. Only 37% of Americans have a positive image of China. So, obviously, whatever we're doing, <laughs> we're going to have to <coughs> do it a little differently. And. Uh, that's a big challenge. It's not just this poll. The most recent Gallup poll, the BBC Globescan poll, all of these polls have China's favorability numbers at, at very low numbers. And in some cases, believe it or not, in the most recent Gallup polls, uh, China's five or six points over where it was right after Tiananmen. Uh, it's, it's hard to understate the impact of Tiananmen. Uh, in the Gallup poll, prior to Tiananmen, 72% of Americans had a favorable impression of China. After Tiananmen, that number was cut in half to 36%. So now in the Pew poll, it's 37%. Oh, clearly, it is, is, is wrong here. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, so I've already used up five minutes. And uh, I want to talk about these challenges, the challenges that... Uh, China is facing. Do I this way? Yes. So uh, I'm talking about domestic and foreign challenges. First, domestic. First, income inequality. Yes, 
as Helen has said, uh, people are indeed getting richer, the middle class is expanding, but at the same time, so is income inequality. And this is a big problem for the government. It talks about it all the time. Yes, people are getting richer. At the same time, a lot of people are not getting richer. And in the poor areas, it's still pretty much as poor as it's been. Uh, another challenge is that the economy is slowing. Uh, and you've all heard about this. Uh, we don't even know exactly uh, how much it's slowing, but um, the most recent quarter, I believe, was 7.5%. Uh, as a friend of mine in Washington said, Barack Obama would love to have a 7.5% GDP growth. But this is down from double-digit growth that's been registered consistently over the last decade. Now, um, the growth in 2012 was the lowest in 13 years, and uh, the drop has continued uh, in 2013. Also, uh, for foreign direct investment had actually dropped in 2012. Uh, and factory orders just last month fell to the lowest in 11 months. Exports to key markets are flagging, uh, and that's not much China can do about that because the economies to which they export are, are not having a, a very good time. Now, so uh, China's leader, Xi Jinping, is, uh, is, is instituting some important economic reforms, and uh, hopefully uh, this will help growth, but it will also, I think, help the market. Now, corruption. If you were to ask a Chinese official what is the greatest challenge domestically, I dare say a lot of them would say corruption. Corruption is rife. It's certainly as bad as ever. Tom alluded to it. Uh, a dean at a leading Chinese university told me recently, nothing happens around here without a payoff. You simply, you can't even get into, even no matter how good you are as a student, you don't get in unless the right hands are greased. That's, that's, and Xi Jinping, again, Xi Jinping is focused on this. And uh, people are worried. That is, the corrupt people are worried. And uh, in fact, a lot of hot money is leaving China. And uh, some of that hot money is being used to purchase real estate. All right? <laughs> um, you know. Uh, so, uh, of course, this particular trial is going to take place. Bo Xi Lai. H how many of you know who Bo Xi Lai is? There you go. Okay. So I don't have to say much. He has been charged. He will be put on trial. Uh, I don't think he will be sentenced to death but probably it'll be death with two-year reprieve, which is a unique Chinese sentence, which I'd be happy to talk about. They sentence you to death, but see how you behave uh, <laughs> for two years. And as Ambrose Pierce, Pierce famously said, nothing focuses a man's attention like his imminent execution. <laughs> and so 99% plus of people who are sentenced to death with two-year reprieve are not executed. Uh, um, so environmental pollution is staggering, no question about that. Food safety is an issue. Um, and surging uh, social unrest. Now, Mark mentioned uh, 30,000 so-called mass incidents a year. Actually, it's more like 200,000, uh, which is staggering. And these are official numbers. Uh, state councilor last year said China averages more than 500 mass incidents a day. So this uh, picture's a thousand words. This is uh, Beijing on so-called Black Saturday in January of this year. Growing concern. This is a Pew poll of Chinese corrupt officials. Uh, on the left hand is 2008. The right is 2012. As you can see, uh, deep concerns about inequality, food safety, and corruption. Uh, domestic challenges. Okay, well, ethnic unrest. And, you know, you're going to find this in the classroom. You're going to get students who say, hey, 120 Tibetans have self-immolated in the last three years. What's going on? Now, that's one of the things definitely that uh, affects China's image, no question about it. Um, and we can talk about that. But China's response has basically to be very tough and to charge family members of those who self-immolate. 
I should say that in Tibetan Buddhism, there is absolutely no tradition of self-immolation. None. Uh, you don't get reincarnated if you commit suicide. Right, so it's, it's, something's going on, and it's pretty serious. There's no sign that the uh, dialogue will resume. Okay, Hong Kong, boy. You know, as someone who spent you know, a large part of my life, I should say I went over in 1972, all right, the year of the Nixon visit. I made four trips to the mainland before Chairman Mao died. So I, I've seen China. Uh, China has changed beyond recognition in my lifetime. But I must say that these days I'm pretty worried about Hong Kong. Uh, a good friend of mine, a, a tycoon in Hong Kong, said, you know, a lot of us just think Hong Kong is becoming ungovernable. Every day there are protests. I don't know how closely you follow this. Uh, some of you may uh, actually on cable get uh, Hong Kong TV. Anybody in here get Hong Kong TV at home? Well, it's something you can get on cable. And you will see a lot of interesting things going on. Demonstrations every day. Uh, the uh, choice, the current uh, chief executive is quite unpopular. Uh, it was a bruising uh, campaign. And uh, I won't go into all the scandals, but uh, he's having a very, very, very tough time. Uh, this thing, I think, is quite interesting. Uh, this, the handling of the Snowden affair has definitely affected sentiment. Uh, there's a lot of unhappiness unha about that, especially in Washington. You know, the Chinese position is, look, okay, we understand that in the short term, but in the long term, uh, we had to do this. Because if, if in fact, he had stayed in Hong Kong, most likely this would have dragged on for years in the courts. And, you know, that would not have been good. Um, and, of course, as Tom has mentioned, there's an appeal to nationalism. Uh, there are increasing uh, controls on the Internet. Um, political arrests, indictments, trials stay high. And here's another challenge, reigning in th the Army. Okay? The Army is getting stronger and stronger. More and more money is being... Uh, will thrown at them. They're purchasing all kinds of Russian and Ukrainian hardware. They're making a lot of it themselves. Um, and the leadership needs to rein that in. You know, Chairman Mao said that political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. But the challenge for the leadership, who are civilians, is to wrest that political power back and make sure that they don't get political power. This is a challenge. And so you may have wondered, you may have seen this, but uh, Mr. Xi Jinping uh, has been uh, going around the country and visiting garrisons. And the message is very simple. The Chinese army needs to be ready to fight and win a war. Now, you know, that, that sounds a little strange. Isn't that what armies do? I mean, you're, you prepare to fight and win. You don't prepare to fight and lose. But just as Tom has said, when, when a leader says something like that, the implication is, well, maybe the Chinese military isn't quite ready to win a war. And so this is, uh, this is something that's going on. All right, moving right along. Uh, this just shows the increase in so-called mass incidents, which are unauthorized protests. And as you can see, the number has been rising. And these are indictments for political crimes. You can see that uh, prior to 2008, uh, they were around 600 a year. Now they average more than double that. All right. International challenges. Well, you know, I'm sure you realize, you've heard, that there are, in fact, a lot of territorial disputes uh, going on between China and its neighbors. And this is, uh, this is causing some disquiet, obviously. And not only in the neighborhood, but particularly in the neighborhood. And, um, you know, this is another reason why China's image has really been taking a hit. Uh, some of these military uh, moves to claim the entire South China Sea, for instance, the so-called nine-dotted line, which you've all seen. Um, big drops in uh, global image, but especially in U.S., Japan, South Korea, Europe, and India. Uh, but uh, in Pakistan, Indonesia, and most African and Latin American countries, China's image is holding up. So you really see a, a split here. Now I just list the territorial disputes. You know, you know them all. There are these 
couple of outcrops of rock in the East China Sea. No one lives there. Uh, but uh, it has become uh, quite an issue between the two countries, a very serious issue. Uh, and of course, Vietnam, Philippines, India, and I once again ask that question, if it comes to it, and there's a very split opinion on this, could the Chinese military actually take on, say, the Japanese Navy successfully? It's a question. Number two, um, great challenge is the lack of strategic trust with the United States. I put up there the Chun Guang Chung affair. This is the blind lawyer. Uh, this uh, certainly uh, has led to quite a bit of mistrust between the two countries. Um, and of course, during this last election, uh, China was a whipping boy. And I must say, not, uh, not fairly. Uh, both candidates, both candidates, not just uh, Romney, but Barack as well, resorted to it. Um, lots of trade actions. Protectionism is a big challenge for China. No question about that. And uh, of course, uh, China's stance over Syria has alienated quite a few countries in the Middle East. Um, and even in Africa, you see in the polling, although China's image, the numbers are still high, you're starting to see some deterioration in views in such countries as South Africa, for instance. And then finally, we have this question of North Korea. Um, Actually, the record shows that China has been working diligently to try to uh, rein in North Korea. And they may be the only people who can, but even then, they will tell you, you know, the image in the West of our influence over North Korea is wildly inflated. North Korea uh, doesn't, we have to know the history here, you know, the history between Korea and China has not always been a happy one. And uh, there are disputes even between Korea and China. So this is my last slide. And uh, I want to get back to this uh, question of image and, and human rights. So you know, this Pew poll that I've just been referring to, uh, the headline of that poll, I'm sure you've all read it, in 39 countries poll, two thirds say that China has either already overtaken the United States or will soon overtake the United States. Two thirds of countries uh, say that. Uh, so that's, that's very interesting. Now, if you dig deeply, both into the poll and into sort of other basic facts, yes, for instance, in terms of the growth of imports, uh, growth of retail sales, yes, very impressive. But remember, on a per capita basis, China is still far behind the United States. In absolute terms, the American economy is double the size of China's. And of course, we have one quarter the number of people. So what's going on? You know, when I grew up, I'm, I'm old enough to remember Sputnik, all right? And after Sputnik, Americans became uh, so afraid that the Soviet Union was gonna take over from the US. And then, of course, 20 years ago, Japan, a very good friend of mine, Ezra Vogel, wrote a book called Japan as Number One. Best-selling English language book in Japanese history <laughs> to this day. Uh, so I, I think Americans have to be more, well, take this all with a grain of salt. China is rising, it's very impressive, but China is not overtaking the United States. Or if it is, it's in the rear view mirror and it's catching up, but the United States is still ahead of China. And if you look at that pupil, in virtually every category, other than the, econ the economy, frankly, I think other than foreign exchange reserves, I mean, that's, that's really what's on people's mind. But if you look at soft power, China has a long way to go uh, in terms of movies, films, ideas. All of these are polled. And China is quite far behind. But it is in this area, and I'm going to end on this, because I think some of you teachers may want to ask me about this. I have spent the last 25 years of my life working on human rights in China. In China. Okay? With the Chinese government, which people find very hard to understand, but I actually do work with the Chinese government on human rights. And uh, I should correct my biography that you're looking at. I am not a lawyer. 
I'm not sure how that got in there, but I'm not a lawyer. I'm a salesman. Okay? I used to sell chemicals, and now I sell human rights. Uh, and I'm a human rights salesman. That's what I do. And it says there, I, Doi Hua works to promote human rights in China. What's left out is we work to promote human rights in China and the United States. Okay? And I can give you a wonderful example of something we're doing right now that is going to have an impact on human rights in the United States because of what we're doing with China. All right? Uh, next February, uh, Dwei Hua, with some other partners, is organizing uh, an international conference on issues related to women in prison. Women in prison. You don't hear a lot about that in this country, but it's the fastest growing demographic, uh, women in prison. And so, in, in China also, it's a very fast growing demographic. Now, we're having this international symposium. China is coming, it's sending some of its top experts. We are too. But uh, you may not be aware of this, uh, but in fact, uh, China's record on how it treats women in prison is much better than, than the United States record. Much better. Actually, uh, our record, the United States, in the field of women in prison is is, is disgraceful. Uh, there's no other word for it. How many of you are aware that in 32 of 50 states, it is legal to shackle women during childbirth? Now, I don't know where the authorities think the women are going to run, uh, but women are shackled. Uh, it was only in 2005 that here in California, the law was changed to prohibit shackling of women in childbirth. And only last September, in 2012, did the legislature outlaw shackling during pregnancy. And California's the first state to do that. Right. In China, in China, by law, women who are nursing and looking after young children serve their sentences outside of jail, including those sentenced to life in prison. Now, think of that. Think about Texas, where a woman who is serving a life sentence, if she's lucky, she gets to see her children once a month. In China, she looks after them at home. So I just want to make that correction. I work on both human rights in China and the United States, and actually both countries have a lot to learn from each other if they stop sort of pointing fingers at each other and saying all kinds of stuff. Instead of that, they should be working together in those areas where the two countries have a lot in common. Another area is juvenile justice, which is something we've been working on, and which with quite a bit of impact, I should say, even here in San Mateo. We brought the Chinese Supreme Court here last year and looked at the American system. China has now implemented, introduced, some very progressive policies in the area of juvenile justice, and it's having a big impact. All right, I won't go into all the details. If you're interested, I can tell you. But in other areas, problems remain. No question about it. Treatment of ethnic minorities is a big one. Treatment of dissent, as Tom has mentioned. You know, dissenters, not just with this government, but going back to ancient times. Uh, dissenters have not uh, fared well, and protesters are harshly treated. Even here, though, there have been some improvements. 